Welcome to the Release to Shine podcast. I'm Megan Wade. And today we have with us a phenomenal woman. She's Anne Go Jogel, attorney of over 33 years, human rights and social justice advocate, who alongside others fought against the numerous injustice of women, including documented sexual and gender-based violence during the post-election period of 2007. She is the founder of the organization Center for Rights Education and Awareness, or CRAW. She, with others, led constitutional reforms, made policy and legislative change, including laws such as the Sexual Offenses Act. As a human rights activist and social justice interventionist, she worked tirelessly in advocating for gender equity, diversity and inclusion, while providing access to justice to women who had experienced sexual and gender-based violence, violation of property rights, as well as inclusion in leadership in all spheres of society. Her work came as at a great price as she was brutalized by the police and arrested several times. In 2010, Anne received the Woman of Courage Award, which was presented to her by the then US Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton and First Lady Michelle Obama. Welcome Anne. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity on this profound platform of Released to Shine. I love that name. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. It is an honor to have you here with me. Who is Anne Jogo? Wow, that's a big question. Anne is a seeker of the greatest vision, of the greatest version of the highest and greatest self. So I'm constantly growing myself to embrace a better, greater me. I'm constantly expanding the possibilities in all areas of my life, in the 13 category smart areas, that is in my vision of life, in my quality of life, in my parenting, in the circle of friends, in the career, as well as impacting society amongst all the other 13 categories of life. So I'm constantly seeking to become a greater better version of me so that I can be able to uh, shine my light uh, in a bigger, better manner in society. So yes, I consider myself a light into the world. A phenomenal woman indeed. Thank you, Anne. You could have focused on any area of law. Why social justice and human rights? That's a good question because it takes me right back to where I started my work and journey in human rights. I was a corporate lawyer 
and I was in the top uh, echelons of a very big insurance company in Kenya. And I was the chief legal officer, uh, head of the legal department, and I did a lot of company secretarial work. And mm-hmm. in my eighth year, very successful, doing great work, I couldn't get myself out of bed. And every day, I just had to have this conversation in the morning. <laughs> and tell Anne, why Anne must get out of this bed. And every day, it will be the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's about the money. It's about the money and it's the money and it's the money and it's the money. And while the money was great, it was not a sufficient reason for me to get out of bed. And I knew that I was ready for the next chapter in my life. I attended a human rights course in Sweden at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. And within two weeks, I knew I wanted to use my law to give a voice to the voiceless and particularly women and children who are facing sexual and gender-based violence. And that gave birth to an organization known as the Center for Rights Education and Awareness. And together with the colleagues, we set it up. And the rest is history, as they say. I have never asked that question any one day because I was able to connect with my mission and with my passion. Okay. Take us back to the moment when you were told that the United States wanted to award you with the Woman of Courage Award. On that day, I was coming from a place known as Machakos. I had just gone out to do my usual community outreach. We used to organize big groups of women. We would educate them about their legal rights. We would empower them so that they could have the ability to access justice and would be able to create awareness around communities. So on this particular day, we had just come from a very big meeting in a place called Machakos. And when I received the call from the U.S. ambassador to Kenya, Mr. Reinberger, I was stunned. I was in shock. And I cannot tell you how it felt because when you start to do this work, nobody goes out with an intention that you're going to seek recognition and accolades. Nobody goes out looking for these affirmations because you you do the work you do because you're committed to, it's a commitment that you have. You're a committed social justice advocate. You are somebody who has made a decision to follow that line of work. I cannot lie that it was both exciting But it was also very humbling because immediately I realized I was not receiving this work because I was better than all the other human rights advocates who are in the trenches. But I was receiving this for and on their behalf so that they could be encouraged in their work of uh, great adversity, trepidation and a lot of uh, sacrifice. I knew that this was not about me. It was about my organization that had been at the forefront of doing this. And it takes a team to be able to get the kind of recognition that we had also been able to recognize. More importantly, I knew that this was in honor of all the women whose rights, including my mother, whose rights had been violated, Mm -hmm. who never gave up and who continued to wake up another day to seek and pursue those rights and the realization. So it was a moment of reflection. It was a moment of uh, gratitude It was that somebody noticed the work that we were doing. And it was a moment of uh, humility because I realized I could not have done this without the strength I got from those that we sought to represent. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What humility. You also met Oprah Winfrey. Please oh. take us on that journey. <laughs> where, where, Megan, where did you get this? You... I saw it online. I saw the photo with you and Oprah. <laughs> God. Oh, my God. Okay. In 2001, I was nominated for another award known as the Community Awareness Award by an organization in Chicago. At this time, I used to think, and I still do, of course, my thoughts have also expanded to include other women. I used to be so taken by the work opera has continued to do over the years, right. impacting thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, indeed millions of people across the world. And I used to, she used to, she used to be one of my greatest inspirations because I used to say, if I can be able to impact even a fraction of the women and people in the world she had been able to impact, I would be fulfilled, I would be excited, I would be happy. So when I got this award that I had been nominated by this organization in Chicago, I don't know how, I just told them, hey, (laughs) if I'm coming to Chicago, I would like to meet Oprah. 
and they laughed. They told me, listen, even us who live in Chicago, we do not have access to her show. And I just told them, just find a way. And they said, they can't promise. But two days before my flight, they came back and they said, guess what? We have two tickets for you. That doesn't mean Oprah is going to see you. It just means that you'll be in the audience during her show. I think that's excellent. Good enough. enough. But still, (laughs) see what you can do to make this happen. And on the morning that we went for the show with a very good friend of mine, she's called Daydrop. We were sitting after going all through the security, we were sitting in the audience and then we had our, my name called out. We went, we found, we had reserved seats. And then six other people had reserved seats that they brought out everybody. And then the show was ready to start. And then Oprah comes in in her usual way, saying hello, uh, you know, how she taps people's hands as she walks in with great energy. And then during the show, somebody came and said, hey, Anne, would you like to stay behind after the show? I was like, I don't mind. And the rest is history. We had a private meeting for about 30 minutes. And all I wanted was to meet her. And it was enough that I met her. That's how it happened. And this has been refreshing, spending this time with you today. Do you have anything that you'd like to share with our viewers and our listeners that I have not asked you? Okay, what I would like to say is that because your, your topic was around adversity, is mm-hmm. that when adversity happens, as it definitely will happen, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. It, it, it will gut you, it will bend you over. But the thing to remember is, are you going to break because of it? Are you going to keep your head or are you going to thrive through it? And what I have found through my own adversities that I have encountered in my life's journey is that adversity comes to make you a better person. I wouldn't be the person I have become without any of the adversities that I have faced. It has enabled me look inside, grow myself, grow my abilities, grow my skills. And as a speaker who goes out to encourage other people going through all manner of storms in life, Mm -hmm. I would never have the credibility to be able to speak to them if I hadn't suffered any of those. And therefore, I would encourage people not to waste their pain or their suffering and indeed use their pain and suffering to be able to overcome. We can overcome any adversity that is thrown at our feet. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing can break. Mm -hmm. In fact, even if you put all the evils and all the ugly things in life, they cannot break the greatness inside yourself. You just need to remember that you are created for greatness and you are created to overcome each and every obstacle that comes your way. You are bigger than any adversity that you'll ever come across and that you must never ever give up, but you must always seek to thrive from anything that is put your way, never forgetting who you are and why you're here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you too for inviting me. You're welcome.